Today I will be talking about processes of linguistic change in South Arabia, in essence what is now Yemen's southwestern Saudi Arabia and parts of western Oman. When I was a BA student I was always asked to start my talk with an anecdote, so that is something I will do. When it comes to South Arabia, and particularly when it comes to South Arabian linguistic particularities, there is a well-known story about an Arab messenger being sent to the court of a local ruler, misunderstanding what was said, and that resulted in his death through prompt auto-defenestration. This local ruler, both amused and bemused, then supposedly said something along the lines of, when you come down here, you'd better hemurize, in essence, learn the hemuritic language. I'll go back to what that means soon. This anecdote shows up in many, many medieval Arabic accounts related to South Arabia. For example, in works of lexicography such as al jawhri Taj al lugha which is 10th century, in Al-Hamdani's semi-historical account Kitab al-Iqlil, 9th century, Ya'qut al-Rumi's famous encyclopedia Mu'jam al-Buldan, and many, many other literary works. They were also aware that the inhabitants of pre-Islamic Yemen wrote in a script very different from the Arabic one, which they called Musnad. The point is obvious. In terms of language and script, something out of the ordinary was going on in South Arabia. What that was finally became clear when in the 19th century the ancient South Arabian script was deciphered and the region's pre-Islamic history, told by the several thousands of inscriptions, suddenly became available. As more inscriptions were rediscovered, translated, and analyzed, so did our knowledge of the language, or rather languages, of these inscriptions improve. And although they were clearly related, related to Arabic, Hebrew, and other Semitic languages, they still, they still clearly stood apart. The fact that, as far as we know, none of these languages were spoken anymore is what caused scholars to start referring to them as ancient South Arabian. But what exactly happened to these languages is not clear. The last day inscription in the South Arabian language was written near the Marib Dam in what is now Yemen, just a decade before the birth of the Prophet, about 900 kilometers northwest in Mecca. Then, after the proverbial dust had settled with the coming of Islam, whatever remained of these languages seems to have been reduced to some of music anecdotes, albeit with apparently potentially fatal consequences. The title of my talk, Linguistic Transformations in Late Antique South Arabia, indicates that I will be talking about gradual processes of linguistic change. The term late antiquity is one that causes some scholarly debate, particularly with regards to delineation, but I will basically be working with Marconi's 2008 definition of the period between the 3rd and 9th century, which he referred to as, quote, the gradual, smooth, and non-traumatic passage from the ancient to what is usually known as the medieval world." End quote. I want to begin by discussing the historical evidence, what and how do we know of South Arabia's culture and languages right before and right after the coming of Islam? And perhaps more importantly, what do we not know? Then I will move on to processes of linguistic change during the same period, which finally leads us to the final part, how does linguistic change in South Arabia help us better understand its history? By the time we agreed late antiquity to begin, that is to say the 3rd century CE, civilization in South Arabia was already ancient and entering its final phase, although its inhabitants may not have realized it yet. Over a millennium earlier, around 1100 BCE, the inhabitants of South Arabia, who had settled the edges of the desert known as the Ramlat al-Sabahtain or the Sayhad, around the end of the last ice age, adopted writing. Writing most likely came to these peoples through the trade routes crossing the Arabian desert, which naturally followed along the southern extremes of the desert. These trade routes facilitated the movement of goods, most famously frankincense, whose tree of course only grows under rather specific circumstances, but also allowed for cultural contact. As a result of this cultural contact, the South Arabians began to write. There are about 12,000 of these inscriptions, written in the same ancient South Arabian languages referred to in the introduction. These are, these are usually divided into four smaller languages, named after their respective states, and ranked from best to least well attested. Sabaic, Manaic, Katabanic, and Hadramitic. Now, not only did these languages differ from each other in terms of lexicon and grammar, but they were also not considered equal. Sabaic, not just being the best attested of these languages, appears to have held something of a prestigious position in the region, and from the 3rd century CE onwards, only Sabaic remained in use. 
The reason for this is the political unification of South Arabia by the Himyarites, who gave their name to the language mentioned in that anecdote in the introduction. The Himyarites, originating what is now southwest Yemen around 110 BCE, had gradually conquered more and more of its neighboring states, until they established political hegemony over all of South Arabia in the 4th century. Although the Himyarite heartland was far from that of the Sabaeans, they adopted the Sabaic language and royal nomenclature due to the political prestige and legitimacy associated with it. The epigraphic and archaeological evidence shows that, by this time, both Christianity and Judaism had made inroads into the region as well. For example, consider this pre-5th century North Arabian inscription from Be'er Hima, a region near the South Arabian oasis town of Najran. It is written by someone calling himself Abd al Masih, in essence, servant of the Messiah, meaning Christ. Around the same time, a Sabaic inscription containing references to the people of Israel, Sha'abahu uh, Israel, and the construction of a synagogue clearly indicates a Jewish presence. Initially, the Himyarite elite was reluctant to show preference for either religion. And it was only during the beginning of the 5th century CE that the Himyarite rulers adopted Judaism as their official religion. The Himyarites' acceptance of Judaism led to increased tensions between them and the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia just across the Red Sea, although that was not the only thing. The epigraphic and archaeological evidence once again show that the Ethiopians had earlier established themselves in South Arabia during the 3rd century CE and were later expelled. The Himyarites' conversion to Judaism potentially served as a justification for Ethiopian geopolitical goals on the Arabian Peninsula. Around 521 CE, for reasons that are not entirely clear, the Ethiopians staged a military coup and placed a pro-Ethiopian Christian ruler on the Himyarite throne. In response, the Himyarite nobility revolted, rallying about a nobleman called Yusuf Asariathar, although he is better known as Yusuf Dunuas, the name later Muslim historians bestowed upon him. And he is generally associated with the infamous events of the Companions of the Pit mentioned in the Quran. Yusuf's revolt led to a second, more drastic Ethiopian intervention. At this point, the Ethiopian ruler Abraha opted to directly assert control over Saudi Arabia. In doing so, Abraha appropriated the style and acts of the sabeo himyaritic rulers before him, leaving inscriptions in the Sabaic language and calling himself King of Saba, Dhuraidan, Hadramat, and Yamnat, as the Himyarites had done before. In the year 548 CE, Abraha left an inscri inscription at the Marib Dam, mentioning, among other things, the construction of a church in Sana'a, the reception of ambassadors from Rome and Persia, as well as the dam's reparation. Ten years after Abraha's deeds, some South Arabian tribesmen loyal to the Ethiopians left another inscription, once again referring to repairs made to the dam in Marib. As far as I am aware, this is the final dated South Arabian inscription, having been written in the year 558 CE. Beyond this point, our understanding of South Arabia's history relies almost exclusively on Islamic period narratives. Although there are some minor and interesting disagreements among the Muslim historians, they basically agree that after Abraha's conquests, the Ethiopians ruled South Arabia for a few more decades. At this point, a local South Arabian prince overthrew the Ethiopians with help of the Sasanians in Persia, but this prince was killed shortly thereafter. At that point, the Persians assumed direct control. A few decades later, the Prophet is supposed to have sent a letter to the Persian governor of Sana'a, who promptly converted to Islam. Although there are some aspects of the story that have been criticized, the general outline of the narrative has generally been accepted by medieval and contemporary Muslim and non-Muslim historians. The Himyarites were conquered by the Ethiopians, who were overthrown by the Persians. They ruled South Arabia until the coming of Islam. Relying exclusively on early Muslim accounts of South Arabia's late pre-Islamic and early Islamic history is, to put it mildly, insufficient. For example, the Muslim historians knew about Yusuf and his revolt, although they had already disagreed on the name of Yusuf's South Arabian predecessor. In comparison, the history of the Sasanians had been much better preserved yet that of South Arabia barely passed beyond the year 400 CE. The early Muslim historians were confronted with two obstacles. Firstly, the South Arabian script, which was nearly indecipherable by the time the first Islamic period writings appear. Secondly, the languages themselves. 
As you'll see in a moment, even those who were able to recognize the script were not able to read the inscriptions themselves. Since the first South Arabian inscriptions were deciphered, scholars of Islam have become interested in the possibility of finding South Arabian influences on the Quran. Arthur Jeffrey's 1937, The Foreign Vocabulary of the Quran, contains nearly 80 lexical items of alleged South Arabian origins. More recently, Orhan Az once again drew attention to Quranic vocabulary, particular to the terms Arim and Khushuk Musannara, and its parallels in the South Arabian epigraphy. What to make of the deific Ar-Rahman, which has such an obvious parallel in the South Arabian term Rahman, particularly in light of the Quranic Ayah 110 of chapter 17. Call upon Allah or upon Ar-Rahman, whatever you call upon, his are the most beautiful names. But even if the name Ar-Rahman originated with the South Arabian Rahmanan, how did we get from the latter to the former? How do we go from Rahmanan to Ar-Rahman? It is now nearly a century since Jeff republished his foreign vocabulary, and their understanding of the historical and linguistic context in which the Quran came into being has improved radically. It seems very plausible that in some places the Quran was influenced by South Arabian cultures and languages, but what makes it so puzzling is how little the medieval Muslim exegetes seem to know about this. Even relatively clear references to South Arabia, such as the final collapse of the dam in Marib, what the Quran refers to as the Sail al-Arim, the dam's flood, are met with confusion. Quranic references to Saba, Sheba of the Bible, find the earliest Muslim exegetes uncertain of its location, rather placing it in Syria or Palestine, Palestine. And they were also unsure whether Sheba was a man, a woman, a valley, a mountain, or something else altogether. And keep in mind that the last pre-Islamic inscription specifically referring to Saba, the state whose prestige was so great that it had the Himyarites to continue it and the Ethiopians to appropriate its model, was written less than 30 years before the Prophet's birth. But a century after his birth, it's as if nobody had ever heard of the place. So, what had happened in these 200 years or so? Although I'm very sympathetic to the idea of there being South Arabian lexical items in the Quran, I have so far not found any satisfying answers to the following question. How did this cultural transfer take place, and why were the Muslim exegetes so unaware of them? Or in other words, what happened in South Arabia in those the size of 200 years or so? Let's take a look at the linguistic evidence. As I mentioned in the introduction, medieval Muslim scholars were aware of South Arabia's linguistic variety, often referring to what they considered South Arabian exoticisms under the umbrella term Himyaritic, in memory of the area's final pre-Islamic indigenous rulers. Let's have a look at what the medieval scholars thought Himyaritic looked like. A line attributed to Abdullah Abbas Razi's history of Sana'a is a relatively well-known example of Himyaritic. Ra'aiku bin khulm kawalatku ibnan min tib which we can render in classical Arabic as Ra'aytu bil manam anni walatu ibnan min dhahab. In essence, I saw in a dream, literally the dream, that I gave birth to a son of gold. Another longer example of Himyaritic appears in a Quburiya of the 10th century Yemeni scholar Al Hamdani, and a Daibaja bin Dauf di Shakar bin Idi Murathid. Fabahalku li adami yasha manda tiht bi manda bahri fadaw asyahu li. Al-Hamdani conveniently translates this to classical Arabic. Or in English, I am Daibaja, daughter of Nauf the Shakar, son of the Murathid. I told my servant to buy me a measure of flour for a measure of pearls, but he did not find any, so I enclosed myself in my tomb. May whoever hears this remember me, and may any woman dress in jewelry so her death may be like my death. Again, in these few lines there are some features that jump out. We find the past negator do, or rather do, there's a complementizer hinge, and a slew of verbs and nouns that don't quite look like Arabic. And when we compare these hemiriticisms to the material found in the pre-Islamic inscriptions, we do indeed find many correspondences. Some late Sabaic texts show a negator da or do or du 
not, as well as the complementizer hing, if, when. This indicates that some features of the medieval lexicographer's hemiritic probably do go back to the non-Arabic languages of the pre-Islamic South Arabian inscriptions. And some of these features can be found in the dialects of spoken in southwestern and North Yemen to this day. I will discuss the implications of these features a bit later. But many scholars, both medieval and contemporary, tend to be somewhat overzealous in categorizing everything that is not evidently classical Arabic as South Arabian. Hemuritic becomes a convenient catch-all term, something of a lexicographical waste bin. For example, there is a famous hadith attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, which has the latter stating, Laysa minam birram siyam bin safar. There is no piety in fasting during travel. This curious definite article M, rather than the classical Al, which we already saw in the previous text, is seen as a South Arabian feature per song. However, it was very recently that Ahmed al Jalad showed that one of the most salient features associated with him uritic, namely the definite article M, was not South Arabian. Instead, it had originated in the Naj, in what is now central Saudi Arabia. These observations are important for two reasons. Firstly, they force us to reconsider the historical development of Arabic and the historical movement of Arabic speakers in the pre-Islamic period. Maps, especially those based on political boundaries, are often misleading because they rarely can account for bi or multilingualism or even the possibility of there being more than one linguistic community existing in roughly the same region. The epigraphic evidence of pre-classical Arabic demonstrates a remarkable amount of variation in the form of the definite article. Next to classical Arabic al, there is han, ha, and so on and so forth. The most logical conclusion is that Arabic speakers who used the definite article m at some point moved to South Arabia and continued to use this article, while elsewhere the al article became dominant. It is no surprise that the definite article both m and an are still used in some remote parts of Yemen today. In his paper on the history of the M article, Al Jalal suggests that speakers of these dialects had probably moved to South Arabia sometime between the 4th and 6th century CE. I would argue, however, that evidence for Arabic speakers in northern South Arabia goes back to at least the 2nd century BCE. During this period, the grip of the Sabaean state began to weaken, and as a result, some important socio political changes occurred in what is now northern Yemen. It witnessed the introduction of new deities, a partial replacement of the political system, and a change in language. The inscriptions from this period are referred to as Haramic or Amoritic, following the region and tribe respectively, and they number about 30 in total. What language these inscriptions reflect has been a matter of some scholarly debate. Christian Robin calls them pseudo sabaic a kind of Sabaic mixed with Arabic, and Peter Stein has considered them Sabaic influenced by Arabic. The language of the Haramic inscription certainly differs from standard Sabaic in some important ways. Let's have a look at some of its most salient features. In a standard Sabaic inscription, the preposition from would be written bin. In Haramic Amoritic, it's min. The conjunction if, when in Sabaic is biyom. In Amoritic, the word id appears. And the negation of the past tense in Sabaic would be formed with a negator al, followed by a verb in the perfect. However, in Amoritic, we see usage of the negator lem, followed by a verb in the imperfect or justive. And lastly, the Amoritic first and second person reflect the suffix t, rather than the k of the Sabaic inscriptions, which we already saw above. Everyone who has studied some Arabic should probably hear alarm bells go off at this point. And yes, on the one hand, many features found in the Amoritic inscriptions are identical with Arabic. On the other hand, there are also two features that seem to be Sabaic in origin, namely the causative H stem, the stem 4 of classical Arabic, which is characterized by a prefix A instead, and the suffix definite article N. How do we put these various features together? Cross-linguistic studies show that some elements of a language transmit more easily than others. Things like nouns are borrowed frequently and easily, but inflectional morphology, such as verbal endings or pronouns and syntactical constructions, do not. The scale of ease on which linguistic elements are borrowed is what linguists refer to as borrowability hierarchy. And when we look at the parts of Amoritic that jump out, it's exactly those features that do not transmit so easily.
The most reasonable conclusion to draw is that the Amoritic inscriptions represent an early form of Arabic written in South Arabian characters and display some features from Sabaic, which, at the time, was still the most prestigious language in the area. Let's take another look at what the medieval accounts tell us. The 10th century librarian and bibliographer Ibn Nadim begins his famous Fihrist by providing an overview of the various languages and scripts of the world. In his discussion of the Himyaritic language and its writing, Ibn Nadim presents a somewhat messy, but generally recognizable overview of the letters of the South Arabian script and their corresponding letters in Arabic. What's more, Ibn Nadim tells us that he saw some copyists in Al Ma'mun's court translating Himyaritic letters on his orders. Fara'aytu juz'an min khuzanat al Ma'muni tarjamatu ma amara bi nashihi Amir al Mu'minun Abdullahi al Ma'mun. An early manuscript of the Fihrist held at the Bidi Library in Dublin indicates a remarkable similarity and a close copy of the South Arabian script is transmitted by Al Hamdani in his Iqlil. Memory of the script was also retained in South Arabia. There are some early Islamic inscriptions, sometimes called bilingual, but this term is not entirely appropriate for reasons that will soon become clear, that use both the Arabic and South Arabian script. The first example is the Tawq bin al haytham inscription. It starts with an Arabic invocation, Ghafara Allah li Tawq bin al haytham Amin. May God forgive Tawq bin al haytham Amen. The Arabic inscription is followed by the author's name again, but now written in the South Arabian script. Based on paleographic grounds, it's been argued that this inscription probably dates to the 3rd or 9th century CE. The second inscription, which I was made aware of via Twitter only very recently, follows a very similar pattern. The first half of the translation reads, Ya Rab Ikhfir li Ahmed ibn Abdullah. And at this point, the author begins to write a dhal in the Arabic script, but then changes his mind and finishes the inscription in the South Arabian script. Dhanabahu Ya Rab, his sins, O Lord. The reasons why we can't really call these bilinguals is that the language of the inscription doesn't change, it is Arabic throughout, it's just a script that does. The inscription is of yet unpublished, but based on the script, it's probably relatively early, possibly 1st century Hijri or 7th century Gregorian. Ibn al-Nadim and al-Hamdani's observations suggest that some knowledge of the South Arabian script survived the South Arabian state collapse in the 6th century, and the epigraphic evidence confirms this. But beyond some scattered manuscriptal and inscriptional evidence, as well as the occasional reference in medieval accounts, it seems that the myth of the Sabaic language itself had disappeared very swiftly. At the very least, we should consider the question how it is possible that the state model, script, and language introduced by the Sabaeans, which had originated 1500 years earlier and was continued by the Himyarites and then appropriated by the Ethiopians, vanished so quickly. I will propose an answer in the following part. Because linguistic change does not occur in a vacuum, I'd like to go back to the socio-political events of the first half of the 6th century. We know of the Ethiopian intervention around 518, followed by the Himyarite revolt in 521, which was followed by another, more permanent Ethiopian invasion. We know that at this moment, some tribes sworn to the Himyarites switched sides and that the Ethiopians appropriated the sabeo himyaritic royal nomenclature. We know that Abraha left an inscription at the Dam of Marib dated to 548 CE, and that ten years later, another inscription, also written at Marib, also mentions him. There was something else going on in South Arabia at the time, something that Abraha refers to in his dam inscription, and something that is coincidentally familiar to us now, namely, the arrival of the Justinian plague. Abraha mentions that the repairs to the dam had to be paused due to disease, and judging by the time frame, it seems this disease is the same as the bubonic plague pandemic that had spread through the Middle East and North Africa in the preceding years. South Arabia, in short, was going through a period of severe socio-political upheaval, which was exacerbated by the arrival of the pandemic. Archaeological and documentary evidence from the Mediterranean shows that the Justinian plague would occasionally return, and it is not unlikely this was the case in South Arabia as well. Even a relatively low death rate could be catastrophic, especially when those capable of reading and writing were disproportionately affected. This would then mean that the transmission of the South Arabian script was filtered through a cultural bottleneck 
Regardless of the pandemic's importance, South Arabia was being plagued, pun intended, by more than one type of socio-catastrophe during this period. Whatever remained of the South Arabian languages was reduced to some remote areas in northern and southwestern Yemen, and the process of Arabization, which had already begun in the pre-Islamic period, rapidly increased. It was only in those remote mountainous areas of southwest Arabia that the last South Arabian languages would continue to coexist with some pre-Islamic varieties of Arabic, which to this day can be seen, or rather heard, in its idiosyncrasies. Putting the pieces of the puzzle together, an interesting picture forms. This picture shows a complex linguistic interaction even before the coming of Islam. As the Amoritic inscriptions show, we know that from the 2nd century BC onwards, there were speakers of Arabic in South Arabia. Then, we know of a second wave of Arabization occurring between the 4th and 6th century CE. We know that, although the Himyarites and the Ethiopians spoke different languages, they maintained their political legitimacy by co-opting the Sabaean state model and continuing to write inscriptions in Sabaic. Invasion and pandemic in the middle of the 6th century finally meant to the use of the Sabaic language in inscriptions, which, at this point, had probably not been spoken for at least two centuries. Between the second half of the 6th and the middle of the 8th century, the languages of the Himyarites were reduced to the remote mountainous areas of southwestern and northern Yemen, where they probably continued to be spoken side by side with some archaic forms of Arabic for a few more centuries. At this point, the first Islamic period descriptions of South Arabia begin to reappear. And because of the social and political collapse of the preceding centuries, its historical memory of South Arabia did not stretch beyond 400 CE. There were still some who were able to read and write in the South Arabian script, such as Talq ibn al-Haytham and Ahmed ibn Abdullah, but what they wrote was Arabic and not Sabaic. It was probably people like Talq and Ahmed who showed people like Al-Hamdani and Ibn al-Nadim what the Himyaritic letters meant, but even they could no longer understand what their ancestors had written, which, for us and for them, must have been extremely frustrating. But we do find some solace in the knowledge that we are not alone in this frustration. As the South Arabian poet Dhu Jadan al Himyari wrote, in memory of the great fortresses of Bainun and Silhin, gently, tears cannot recall what is sped, do not grieve for those who are dead. After Bainun, no stones, no traces remain, and after Silhin, Shalman built such houses again.